I'm Mark Lupker from the Cyber Center for Education and Innovation out of the home of the National Cryptologic Museum. And we're very proud today to, to introduce to you Ron uh, Gupla, who's our first uh, speaker. Ron is, uh, Gula is uh, the president of Gula Tech Adventures with a focus on cybersecurity technology and strategy. Uh, Ron has got a very rich background in intrusion detection and risk mitigation, uh, et cetera, and even talking about deploying honey pots. That might be an interesting question later on. Uh, he uh, cut his teeth at NSA in penetration testing, and he does a lot of work for, uh, for us nonprofits like uh, the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation and other things like uh, the Cyber Moonshot and the National Security Institute. Um, so, uh, Ron, welcome to the Cybersecurity Chat uh, Series, and we look forward to you sharing uh, with everyone online about trust. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I can't see you in the audience. And if you are uh, watching this uh, in the future at some point, today we're gonna be talking about data security and a lot of things that uh, imply about that, such as uh, trust and uh, complexity. And we're gonna get into a lot of that. I have a lot of visual aids today because you're probably gonna get tired of looking at me, especially if you've been doing uh, Zoom classes remotely. So as Mark said, my name is Ron Gula. I've uh, been in the industry for about 20, 25 years, and I was in cybersecurity before it was called cyber. Uh, we used to just call it information security. So what I'm gonna to try to do is distill all the kind of different things I've learned over the years in as an interesting level of a way. And one of the most useful ways to talk about data security is when we think of safes. Now, you might not have anything in a safe or think about safes, but I think everybody has seen safe in a cartoon or a movie. And if I was gonna ask you, you know, is the thing inside the safe secure? Is that thing inside there, is it protected? And, you know, we could talk about that. And what does it really mean to be secure? Well, if you imagine a burglar, Kind of, kind of breaking into a bank to steal the money out of the safe. Uh, you know, what are the skills of the burglar as prevented by the safe? Uh, if the ability to just steal the safe with a forklift and maybe like some sort of movie like Batman where Bane, you know, is just breaking into things and stealing things, that's a different level of threat. Uh, but if you don't think of it as in terms of money, if you think of it like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you don't want your little brother or little sister to steal that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, well, maybe that safe is actually too complex you know, and too expensive for you to protect a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So data security has all of these issues with it. So whether you're protecting things that are really interesting, such as maybe the schedule of the president of the United States, or things that are kind of sensitive to you, such as the grades you got on last week's history exam, uh, there's different levels of data that's out there. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to make up a lot of this stuff. The NSA actually came out with something called the Orange Book, which described all the different ways. And if I put them out there, it would look like the rainbow. There's so many pages out there. But basically, all data security comes down to three things, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, confidentiality basically says, is the data that you're having, you know, is it private? You know, who else can change or who, uh, you know, who can see that? Uh, you know, if, if you tell two people and then two people know it, but is that data private? Is it confidential? Now, that's a lot different than integrity. Let's say integrity is where you change the data. So maybe we go back to that safe argument and I put a will into that safe. Well, I might not want people to know what's in that will. You might not want to know what your inheritance is or maybe the terms of a contract, but if somebody could break into that safe and then change the terms of that contract and will, they violated the integrity of that. So confidentiality and integrity are really two, two completely different things. But then there's actually another third area, which is called availability. The day you go to get that safe and it's not there because somebody stole it or they, they blew it up or it, it, it was destroyed in, an, in a flood, uh, that's availability. And it turns out that almost anything you want to do with data security implies one of these three things. And we're going to be getting into them uh, uh, in a little bit more. But there's a few other things that are not really implied in there. A real big one is trust. So when you have something like a phone, or let's, let's stick with that, uh, the, the safe issue. If you have the safe, you kind of trust that if you bought a safe, that the vendor who made that safe 
didn't have any flaws in it, that they didn't put a backdoor password in it such that only they could unlock it. So you kind of trust that. And if the safe is at your bank, you kind of trust the people at the bank to make sure that they're not looking in that safe and taking those things and taking the money. We talked about the value of data a little bit. You know, you wouldn't really want to spend a million dollars protecting, you know, the recipe for your mom's peanut butter and jelly and banana sandwich. And at the same time, you know, you really don't want to take the plans for the new F-22 or the, the next uh, stealth bomber and protect them, you know, with basically some masking tape that says do not, do not open. So a lot of times when people talk about data security, there's different levels of security that can be applied to that based on what you're trying to do. Now, one of the things that makes things a little bit more complex is you have this notion of data at rest and data in motion. Now, data at rest is pretty easy to understand when you think about the safe that's in a bank, right? There's my stuff in that safe. But if I'm going to take those important documents out and I'm going to then transport them somewhere, you may imagine a Brinks truck, you may imagine some sort of a secured transport to move these things around. Data itself is very similar on the internet. You have files on your computer, you have files on your phone, but when you send emails around, when you Snapchat and you send images around, that data is in motion. And if you were to describe all the different computers that were involved in making your Snapchat show up with your, at your friend or have a Discord work while you're playing Minecraft, it, all of that simplicity is actually quite complex uh, behind. And understanding how the data flows through all that is really kind of, kind of interesting. Now, anywhere along the way, any one of those devices can have something called a vulnerability. Now, a vulnerability could be uh, something that allows a hacker to break into a computer. And that vulnerability could be something that was unintended. Every now and then you hear about how maybe Apple or Microsoft has to have patches because they release code and that code can be used in an unintended manner. At the same time though, we can also set up computers and devices incorrectly or perhaps more conveniently. For example, having a Wi-Fi set up called, you know, for guests with no password at all. Now maybe that's really good, but maybe that, that guest network is part of my home network and it just makes it that much easy for somebody to break into the, to the network. Now the last thing that we have to talk about with data security, and we'll get into some examples here is threats. If we didn't have threats, if we didn't have people who were on the internet trying to steal our identities, steal our secret plans, the F-22, you know, steal your, your computer's resources, you know, we wouldn't have to go through a lot of this stuff. But the reality is, is the internet is a very, very scary, scary place. And there's a lot of different parties out there who want to steal our money, steal our identities, uh, and perhaps even use you as students in high school to get access to your to your parents' computers and your parents' finances. So there's a lot of interesting things that are going on out there. That's a very, very, very high level view of, uh, of data security. So what I wanted to do now is kind of take some specific uh, examples of data security that have been in the media and that have been in the news and talk about that. So one of the first things we're gonna talk about is voting. Now you're all getting close to the age where you're going to get a chance to vote. It might be voting for your parent teachers association for your school board. It could be for a, a local government official for where you're at. It could be you're, maybe you're going to vote in the next presidential election. But voting is a very interesting topic because it combines a couple different elements of that confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So on one hand, when we go vote, we want our vote to be confidential. If you're voting for somebody who's not popular, you might not want to be known that you voted for that person. And likewise, if you voted for somebody, maybe, maybe you just don't want that, that vote out there. You want the vote that you cast to not be changed. You want your vote to, uh, to not be modified. That's that integrity part. And frankly, you want to be able to vote. And, and this is a really interesting issue right now in the time of COVID because people who are gathering in large numbers, such as a voting station, could possibly be infecting other people. So we're looking at things like voting by mail. But if you think about the simple voting thing, like let's say you have one vote and it's a piece of paper and you either put an X on it for candidate one and, or put an X for candidate two and you drop that into the ballot box. And at the end of the day, all we had to do was count those number of votes and put them together. That is, there's still a lot of opportunities there to have subterfuge, to have people who are counting those votes 
maybe count a little bit more for their candidate, not the other candidate. Maybe they find that when you put that X, you didn't put it through all the way. So they look at that and they go, well, I don't know if that's a valid X. So we're going to cast that out. And, and this sounds insane and probably overly complex, but this is part of the issues with data security, how you actually gather information and do that. You probably also heard about paper ballots. So let's assume that we have a hundred percent paper ballot. One of the things you're going to do eventually is you're eventually going to bring a computer into that equation. A computer is going to be used to enter the votes from perhaps a county or a precinct in the county. And of course that computer can be modified and, and it gets even more interesting like, like that. So, so this is a classic problem with data security. And I, I kind of lead with this because if you're thinking about getting into the areas of cybersecurity, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody really thought of elections as something could, that would dramatically affect the outcome of a nation. Of course it does, right? We have a peaceful regime change every couple, every, every four years, right? We, we, do, uh, we do those votes. And in, some, and, and in many places, every, every two years. And my point is, is that this is something how we govern ourselves and we need our best and our brightest people working on these solutions. So right now, there's a lot of opportunity to learn about voting, about making them secure, about testing them to make sure that nobody has been modified those things. And it's a very, very, uh, very exciting time. As my last comment on that is some states are actually considering 100% voting online. Now you might've grown up online your entire life, but that kind of bothers me a little bit because there's a lot of opportunity to dramatically change how those votes are recorded and modified. And the federal government has come out in a very bipartisan way, nonpartisan way, saying that these things are not necessarily the most, the most secure. All right, now something else that's probably near and dear to your heart is your mobile device. And my guess is you might even be watching this on a mobile device, or you might have one in your hand while you're watching it. Either way, I get it. So let's talk about those things. How secure are those devices? I have a lot of uh, people when I speak for high schools, they all ask, you know, is my phone secure? Uh, you know, can I, can I do that? Well, let's think about that. Uh, where was the phone made? You know, the phone was made uh, probably overseas, probably in China, probably in um, perhaps the Philippines, perhaps uh, some other places. Part, part certainly came from all over the place. Nobody really, you probably don't know all the people who went into that. So you're trusting that everything in that phone is working for you and it's, and, it's, and it's pretty good. And for the most part, you know, the vendors that you're used to, Google and Apple, they do a really good job of being fairly transparent about how the device was made, what kind of chips are in there. And if there is a vulnerability, you know, they tend to be very public about, about fixing those things. What gets kind of interesting, though, is when you really think about who you're trusting. It's one thing for an Apple company to come out and say, here is everything we are doing for encryption. Here's what we can read and here's what we can't read. But then you also hear about the federal government wanting to, and rightly so, let's kind of look at some of that encryption on terrorist cell phones or perhaps uh, people who are doing you know, bad things with children. So you get into this kind of debate about, well, what is data security? Do you have really, really good privacy, that confidentiality? Or does somebody else have the ability to, to read your data? And you should always think about, well, who that is. Now, I very quickly said Apple and Google, but if you start thinking about all the different brands that you're using on your phone, you might use Microsoft for email. You might use Google for searching. You might have you know, some special apps that you use for, for a Call of Duty skin management or for, for whatever it is. The more apps you're putting on your phone, every one of those applications has its own set of data security issues. Every vendor you're working with is going to do something with that data. And there's a different sort of agreement that you have with them and trying to keep view of all that is very, very difficult for one, somebody in high school to understand that people might be taking your data and, and, and selling it, but two, trying to think about what those byproducts are. For example, you probably have heard of TikTok. Uh, TikTok was actually an app that was banned by the U.S. Army and a lot of the, a lot of the Department of Defense because basically we were sending images of our faces and these cool videos and cute videos that you're, you're, you're making uh, back to a foreign country. And that foreign country was China. And maybe when you grow up, they were going to be able to use that face and understand who you are. And maybe if you have a job at the National Security Agency someday, they can spoof your identity. Now, those kind of things seem far-fetched. But these are the kind of things that data scientists are, are really kind of worried about. Now, a lot of you probably have jobs. You probably actually have part-time jobs. You probably go to the ATM. 
to, to get your, uh, your money. Well, let's say there was a cyber attack on uh, the United States and you couldn't go and get that money. You couldn't go and, and, uh, and get that. I could have said a credit card system could have been down, but you get it. A lot of times the money that you get, the value of what you get is ones and zeros that are in a system. So if you can't get that out, that's a form of availability. So being able to, to work in those kind of fields of e-commerce and banking and, and uh, you know, trying to put, put out to the public like that is a very interesting topic and very, very interesting to, um, to try to keep that secure. But we also want to keep it very usable. Right? I think a lot of you, I just, even though I got done saying that having more and more apps on your phone is kind of a potential security issue, it's also very convenient. I have my credit unions app on, on my phone and I like to be able to wire money and, and see if a check's been deposited and see if bills have been paid. It's very convenient. But trying to keep that secure, trying to make it so that hackers can't get in there, trying to understand all that stuff is very interesting and very part of what's going on. Now, another thing that's going on, I'm sure you've heard about Zoom bombing. There's no clever, clever cartoon for how does Zoom bombing work. Now, if you're not familiar with Zoom bombing is, Zoom bombing is basically when you get invited to a meeting, a virtual meeting, and it's just a URL. Here is the link, the Zoom link for this meeting, and it's just a long URL. There's no password. And you know, so what happens, uh, there's been a lot of stories where people are connecting into these Zoom meetings and they are displaying inappropriate information. Uh, they're displaying things that would, you, you might find offensive. But what's really going on is that an unauthenticated person, an unauthenticated party is coming in because the secrecy, the privacy, the confidentiality of what was done is, is, is shareable. And having a password, you know, maybe you could put, if you have an email of, of the URL and the password, you know, maybe somebody could hack into your computer and use that password to then, you know, hit into your Zoom meeting. That's very real. But what's happening is that there's so many Zoom meetings right now that that meeting ID is predictable. And you can write a program to just come up and predict what potential Zoom meetings are and just try to connect to them. It's kind of like um, if you were going to guess a URL or you were going to guess a phone number, or if you've ever gotten a phone call and you recognize the area code and you actually understand, well, that's probably from my, uh, my, my local zip code or my local area code. It's the same kind of principle. It's pretty easy to program a computer and just go through all of that stuff. Now, that mistake, that coding error, that potential weakness, that has been around for 20, 30 years. When I was at the NSA and I was breaking into Unix machines and doing, doing testing of stuff like that, that type of predictability of how a computer is going to behave is the kind of thing an adversary can use to, to break in. And that's really unfortunate because as convenient as, as it is, it becomes less convenient to use passwords and other things like that. What happens is that people who want to break into Zoom meetings can do that. Now, maybe the Zoom bombing is getting some headlines, but maybe what's more interesting is there's a top secret, you know, conversation and somebody can guess that conversation and, and break in that way. So now a very similar one to Zoom bombing is email phishing. And a lot of times I get asked, what can we do to stop email phishing? And this is exactly the same problem. The internet and the email system is a very open system designed to make it very easy to transport email. There's no one place to log into. There's no one place. It's all interoperable. But because of that interoperability, you can pretty much spoof email and, and send it around. And as much as you're probably doing communication with your teachers and perhaps even your friends, not on email, email is going to be around. As soon as you get to college and as soon as you get to uh, the, the corporate world, you're going to be using email a, a lot more. It just does not seem to be going away. Uh, it's something that I think is, as a data scientist, as a, as a data security person, a lot of corporations are really struggling this way because a fake email is the number one way that adversaries, whether they are just trying to break in to a network or they're, or they're a nation state trying to break in, it's still the number one way people are breaking into organizations. And now with a lot of organizations working from home because of COVID, it's even more rampant because when you're at home, not only are you using your corporate email, but you're probably online social media, you're probably online with your personal, that very likely from the same computer. And because of that, you're much more vulnerable to if you got fished on your personal computer, which you're using for work, it's very possible that those things can you know, can be used there. The last topic I'm going to discuss is something called 5G. And then we're going to get into some questions and a little bit, how do you get into cybersecurity? 
Now, 5G, if you're not familiar with 5G is, if you have a phone, pick it out, it probably says 3G on it. And basically what, what this is, is a reference to is the cell phone infrastructure in the United States. And, you know, basically what we're talking about is how most of the computers are going to be communicating in the next 10 to 15 years. So right now you're probably familiar with maybe Wi-Fi at school, Wi-Fi at home, your computers might have an ethernet uh, cable in, but then once you leave that area, your phone is just on 3G, it's just on the internet, it's just on the cell network, and you're okay with that. And this is what it's been like for the past 20 years or so, if not, if not longer. But what's gonna happen very quickly is that once 5G is rolled out, 5G is so fast, you don't really need home Wi-Fi anymore. So this is gonna change how you get Netflix. Like you might go and your TV that you buy 10 years from now, it might just show up at your house and it just has a 5G connection and it's just all, it's all built in. You might not need a wired network in your home anymore because everything you do is on the internet anyway. We're going, we're all moving to the cloud. So the issue is that, okay, well, who's building that network? Even though the network might say Verizon, it might say AT&T, they might be using hardware that was made by countries that are not uh, sympathetic to the United States. If you could imagine that you could put code in there, who do you trust, right? How do you build these things? If somebody is using that information, even if it's encrypted, then maybe it's like White House communications and they can turn it off and you can affect the availability of those communications. This is a very, very big deal. And even more so, this is a big deal worldwide because in the US, even though we might not make a decision to use 5G uh, that's built by a country who might not be friendly to us. What about Africa? You know, what about the United Kingdom? What about Europe? What about other nations in Asia? If they're going to get built into these other kind of, you know, geopolitical uh, apparatuses, we might be kind of like locked out of that from not only selling the next best app that you make, uh, but it might be difficult and part of our foreign policy. If you haven't heard it before, and you know, people talk about data being the new oil, if you're looking for a career in, in cybersecurity, which we'll be getting into in a minute, you know, working with the ones and zeros, trying to collect that information is very, very uh, important. If you can control how that information flows or even when it flows, it's, it becomes very much like uh, having an oil resource right in, your, right in your room. So with that, I hope that was a really good high level of just some of the different aspects of data security. I hope that we got some, uh, some interesting questions that we, can, uh, that we can talk about. I got a question that said, how do I know that the text or email message I got was from the person sending it? There's a couple different layers of things going on out there. So first of all, if you just talk about text messages, a text message is something that the cell phone system provides. People have been texting since they've been paging and you know, can you spoof these things? Sure, you can spoof them. There's, there's not a lot of authentication to do that. If you've heard about cell phone cloning, if you've heard about how to do uh, different types of a cell phone level copying and shenanigans, these have been happening for the last 20 years or, or, or so. Now, however, that's not the same thing as all the different types of messages you might see. And when people say text messages, an iMessage, such as Apple messaging, is completely different than that. It's a lot more security, it's a lot more authentication. There's a logged in cloud account with Apple, but let's say your computer was left uh, open for a minute or it was unpatched and I break into your computer and you have a Mac computer tied to your Apple iPhone account. I could very easily break into that and then send a message from there. Now, technically it still comes from that authenticated person. Now it's very similar on Android. They have a very similar system. There's, there's the Google chat, Google uh, messaging. But then you also have issues like Signal. You have things like Telegram, which are more encrypted, but every one of these services has another desktop component, which means it can be hackable and, and done so. For the advanced users out there, I would try to look at Signal and then understand the cryptography with two Signal users. I don't have my phone here. There we go. You can actually take a Signal and you can, you can send uh, a picture that looks like one of those barcode QRC codes things, show it to the other person and they can verify each other. And that's like a secure pairing of those folks. But that's a great question. One of the other questions I got, I think is going to lead into, you were going to talk about uh, your profession and what you did and what got you interested in cyber. Because someone was interested on, on what do I need to do a high school student on, on preparing uh, myself to enter the cybersecurity uh, environment. 
Yeah, that's maybe I'll just talk now a little bit a little bit on that. So when I got involved in cyber, it was the mid '90s, and you know the mid '90s, you know things like the web browser was still a new a new thing. You know, there people hadn't even invented you know a lot of these uh, things that were very common commonly done today. So you know when I talk about people getting involved in cyber cybersecurity specifically, I think it's a lot like the healthcare system. If you were going to become a cancer researcher, you might not follow the same steps as a cancer doctor. You might not even follow the same steps as a hospice person who's trying to care for people who, who, who have cancer. Cyber is much the same way in that there are so many different things you could be doing. It becomes very, very overwhelming. And what you're learning today is might, it might not be relevant tomorrow. Like when I was learning, I was an expert in the Solaris Unix operating system. Solaris has a gone thing. Everybody uses Linux now or Mac or, of course, Windows. What might it be in the future? It could be something completely different. There's new technologies like Kubernetes, Docker, the ability to run things in a serverless mode. So what you can learn now is I, I tell people to try to learn a specific skill so they're at least competent in it could be penetration testing, could be patching a computer, could be just installing things. But what you really need to learn is you really need to learn how things work. If you can describe accurately what happens when you click on a browser and the page gets filled and you could describe all the different things that happen, how, how the internet works, you're on your way. You're on your way to doing that. If you understand how things work, it's easier for you to understand how people will break that. And one of the issues I've had is a lot of times people just want to learn how to break things first. They want to be a hacker. They want to, they want to get in there. And I can show you all sorts of tools that would make it do that. But if you've ever seen the Mickey Mouse movie where Mickey Mouse is with the wizard and he sees the book and he learns all the spells and then the brooms start dancing around. First of all, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, Disney has some other characters besides uh, the frozen people, right? Um, but having said that, you know, that's an example of you can learn a spell, you can learn a hacking tool, but you're still not maybe understanding how everything works underneath it. So as you're thinking about going into cybersecurity, you should spend a good time learning how things work. Another question is, how do I know if an app is safe to use? You mentioned TikTok as an example of an app to avoid. So how, how do you know, you know, you, you, get a, you get your phone and somebody says, hey, get this app. It's a great uh, game or it's a great application. Uh, how do you know? That's a great question. So, so the two things. So one, if your phone is jailbroken, a lot of apps that you're loading there are actually very hostile. Uh, when you jailbreak your phone, you remove some protections that apps normally can't use to, to, to spy on you. Now, having said that, you know, the apps that are in the app stores, the Google Play Store, the Apple App Store, they've all been vetted by Apple and Google. They don't necessarily, you know, mean that they're going to keep all your data, you know, here in the United States and they're not going to sell your data. But a lot of times it's too good to be true. You know, if you think about Facebook and how much we use Facebook, and you're probably using Facebook and you don't even know you're using Facebook. Their entire business model is taking all of your data and doing some amazing things with it. Like they're bringing us together, they're, they're, but they're also selling you Levi's jeans and new cosmetics and a brand new car. And there are some issues with that. There are some very, very big issues that you should feel a little uncomfortable with or at least understand about those things. It's akin to if you go to a restaurant, you know, you kind of trust that the people in the back of the kitchen are clean and, and uh, they're preparing the food and they're not you know, doing anything they shouldn't be doing. You kind of would like to see that on all your apps and you really, you really can't. So if it's too good to be true, you're probably the product. You, it means they're selling your stuff and, and you got to keep that in mind. Uh, now, if, you're, if you come from a well-to-do high school, maybe you should think about having two phones or at least one phone where you put all your games on it and maybe, maybe like an iPad or some sort of device where you do your banking and you keep everything very separate. You keep your things very private on that. And, and that's a great way of, of doing that. Another thing you should think about is maybe having pseudonyms. Uh, you know, if you go into uh, Facebook, there's no reason you should use your, you know, I have to think about legally. I think legally they do, they do require you to log on, but they don't check, you know? So it's, you, you think about those kind of, uh, of issues going, going forward. 
the last thing I should let you know is that, you know, when you do have the app and it says, hey, you know, this password manager really wants your photo, your voice, you know, your, your key prints. You're like, why is it taking that? But then you realize, well, they might turn on facial authentication and those, those kind of things. So, so you have to kind of track all that kind of stuff. I did get a curiosity question of, uh, and I probably spurred it when I said something about honeypots. Uh, somebody goes, what is that? One of the things I didn't get into is, uh, from a data security point of view, is the complexity issue. With that safe, pretty easy to say, I got that safe right there. But when you start talking about servers and data in the cloud and all my laptops, and you start doing it in terms of a large enterprise, you know, a big bank like Morgan Stanley, a big bank like, like Bank of America, they've got hundreds of thousands of computing devices. Well, how do you protect that? You would like to think that you make all those decisions correctly, you've got all the controls in place, and sometimes you don't. Well, one control you could do, one way to prevent those things is having a couple fake systems out there that don't do anything except waiting for somebody to come along. Because one of the things you have to do to break into a network is you have to do reconnaissance on that network and figure out what is there. Uh, this is akin to, you know, maybe there's fake bank accounts. Uh, maybe that Zoom bombing thing we talked about, maybe you put some fake uh, Zoom things out there, you just make it harder for, for bad guys to be able to get into those kind of systems. So that's a honeypot. There's companies out there that do this. There's ways to do it for free. It's very interesting technology because a lot of hackers, they actually look for honeypots and so they can avoid them because they don't want to be detected. But that's a great, uh, it's a great question. Great. I just put out in the chat window to see if there's any other questions for Ron. And Mark, I see the one there about opportunities for high schools and cyber. So I can talk about that a, a little okay, bit. Okay, good. So I'm coming to you today from from Maryland. And uh, there's a company I, I helped found, I was CEO of it called Tenable Network Security. Uh, right now it's over a thousand people. They've got, you know, not everybody there, believe it or not, is a cyber expert. Uh, we have support people, we have programming people, we have sales people, we have marketing people, we have people who understand terms and conditions in, in our law. Every one of those people would say that they are in the cyber industry though. So when you're thinking about going into cybersecurity, there's more than just being a hacker and, and, and chasing hackers and that, that sort of thing. Um, now, specifically for a high schooler, you know, what can you do? Well, first of all, if you can code at all, and by I say, uh, can you code, could you pass a certification exam for C programming, for JavaScript, for, uh, for Go? I, I know JavaScript and Python is taught quite a bit out there. If you can code those kind of things, that's good. Now, the question is, is can you find a job or an internship doing those kind of things? Now, you might think, okay, maybe the, these guys over here, they're doing embedded C programming. They're doing assembly com programming. They're doing cloud for programming Lambda. You might think, oh, I've never done that. You'd be surprised how much the same stuff. It's just a different, slightly format. But you have to look at it from an employer's point of view. An employer is thinking about, you know, are they going to hire you maybe three years from now? four years from now, because there's such a shortage of cyber experts that are, that are out there. So when you come in, you should really be thinking about what have you done from an extra credit point of view, what self-initiated, self-motivation things you've done to teach yourself in cyber. Because I'm going to tell you this, I still do it. And the, the most successful people still do it. There's so much new technology out there and there's so much new things out there. So when you're applying for these internships, when you're applying for these opportunities, put code samples down. If you're really proud of something you did, put it down and say, hey, you know, I got an A on this or I, I, I did this, I led the product. You would be surprised how far that goes with a potential employer. So that's, there, there are uh, job opportunities for high schools. Specifically, it's coding and anything you can do to get a certification. And then one of the things I'll throw out there is um, Cybrary. So there's two URLs here, but Cybrary is the one on top, C-Y-B-R-A-R-Y dot I-T. Um, think of it as library, but, but Cybrary. So they actually have training for a wide variety of cyber stuff, all for free. But if you take the training, you can pay for a certification exam. It's like 20 bucks, 40 bucks, you know, it, it, and if you can pass that, man, that, when you apply, I, I know I used to get stacks in stacks of resumes when I was CEO at Tenable. Hey, can I, and we would only take maybe 20 kids, you know, that, that kind of thing. You're competing against college people who want interns as well. But the more you can do to stack in your favor, the, the better that is. Ron, there was another question on, is a VPN a good thing to use? 
So let's talk about, so the question is, is the VPN a good thing to, uh, to use? So if we go back to the um, confidentiality, integrity and, and availability, right? So why do you want that VPN? Well, do you want the VPN so you can be anonymous, go into a website, or do you want the VPN so that you're anonymous kind of at, at Starbucks, if you're at, at a hostile place? So if, you know, there's different kind of VPNs for, for, and plus there's also a secure way to get back to your office, right? But if you're using a VPN and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be, I, I hear a lot of high schools, you know, to steal Netflix, to steal other things and stuff like that. Um, you can still be tracked. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, but your browser, when you interact with these sites on the other side, yes, you might be going over a VPN. They're still tracking you. They're still knowing where, where you're coming with Netflix. And I've actually worked with a lot of military folks who go overseas and they want to get the U.S. Netflix as they can't get it, you know, in, in Germany or something like that. You know, so there's a reason for that. But if you're trying to use a VPN at, uh, you know, when you're out and about because you don't trust your friend's Wi-Fi, you don't trust the, the, the coffee shop's Wi-Fi, not, not I think a lot of um, folks in high school are drinking coffee, but you get my, my point. What that does is it just moves that trust to somebody else. So if you trust the, your VPN provider, but you don't trust your shopping mall, that's what you're saying. Like, you're just saying, I'm going to trust my VPN provider because I think that the VPN provider where they terminate on the internet is going to do something more trustworthy than my shopping mall. And at least you're removing a lot of people who you trust. So when you look at it like that, it's not really offering me that much protection, right? If you're going to go to the world's most hackable website and there's malware that you're going to download, going to it over a VPN, there's some VPN services that'll filter some things out, but for the most part, it's not going to protect your browser. It'll protect people along the way from souping at what you're doing. I like a VPN. I use a VPN when I'm remotely, especially if I'm in a foreign country, especially if I'm trying to get back to where I want to go. But, but for just browsing the internet, you're better off keeping your computers patched and uh, figuring out where you're going versus getting there securely. Are there any other questions? Let me talk about two other, two other things. So the other URL I had up there was uh, Security Weekly. So Security Weekly, it's a, it's a friend of mine. I got a couple of friends there, but they, they have almost a couple thousand hours of podcast where they interview people in this kind of manner. Uh, you know, what, what do you do? What kind of security issues do you have? How can we get more women and minorities in, in, into cyber? How can we, you know, is this latest product from, from Cisco and Microsoft? Is it, is it any good? Is anybody using it? There's a lot of stuff there. It doesn't necessarily show up in Google searches and stuff, but if you go there, they've got all these different shows. They're all on YouTube. If you find something that you're really interested in, chances are you can learn something from that. And then lastly, I find a lot of people in uh, cybersecurity are into science fiction a little bit. So there's two books I want to uh, refer. So one is called Snow Crash, and the other one's called The Cuckoo's Egg. Now, Snow Crash is a science fiction book, fantasy. Uh, it's, it's all about hacking in the future. And it kind of shows you kind of where we're going. A lot of folks that I started with in cyber, uh, they read this book. They're still reading it. HBO is going to make a, a miniseries on this. I highly recommend you read the book. Now, it's going to seem like Star Wars and it's going to seem like Ready Player One in some cases, but the rules of how things work in Snow Crash are much more grounded in reality than what I've seen in other media. And it's really good to inspire people to get into this stuff. Now, Cuckoo's Egg, on the other hand, is a real story. Cuckoo's Egg is a story by this gentleman named Cliff Stoll, who's an astronomer. And back in the days when you had to pay for a computer to like compute things, he was coming up short um, doing some astronomy calculations. And it turned out there was a Russian hacker in his computer. And in the early 90s, late 80s, I forget the exact date. It's, it, this is a very dated book. You're not going to learn a, a lot about how the internet works in this. But a lot of the stuff that's there still, still happens. Yeah. And the amount of interconnectivity and how many layers are there. And if you read this and you're going, wow, that's pretty cool. Well, guess what? I mean, the internet got a lot more complex. There's a lot more layers. There's a lot more different things to, to do. Both of those books should give you a really good grounding into a career in, in, in cybersecurity. Ron, I'll join you on that. The Cuckoo's Egg, I think, is a, is a must read and it's a foundational book. It really, Cliff is a great writer. It's a very entertaining. It's a quick read. And it really does show kind of the 
the the mind we're talking about and that you shared with these students is you have to have a mind that's curious a mind that goes wait a minute this doesn't make sense i think it was what 25 cents discrepancy mm -hmm. and it just was bugging him on why there was a 25 cent imbalance and so it was this curiosity that ended up finding and i think they did a honey pot to trap the guy and they came in while he was doing the the dirty deed so a really cool book to to get you excited about this uh, career and profession so ron thank you very much for leading us off on this cybersecurity chat series thank you for for being with us and sharing your time we look forward to you joining us in the future on future talks and all those who participated today thank you for being here the this will be is recorded so we'll have it in in the library for others to to see and to gain the, the knowledge that Ron shared with us today. So on behalf of the, the Cyber Center for Education and Innovation out of the National Cryptologic Museum, uh, Ron, thank you for, for being here. And for those who signed in today, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for everybody who joined. Y'all have a great afternoon.